In this lecture, we're going to be talking about barriers to effective listening and some poor listening behaviors. But barriers for effective listening are basically the reasons why we don't listen as well as we should, and not all of them are necessarily in our control. The purpose of learning these, though, is just to be aware of them. If you recognize that they're there, you're able to recognize that and say, hey, I'm engaging in pseudo listening right now. I'm probably not getting the information and adjust your behavior accordingly. Just becoming more aware of these things, you'll start observing yourself doing them and then that you'll know how to stop. So first we have bar barriers of the self. Sometimes we're very self-focused where we're listening to ourselves and our internal ideas or internal thoughts instead of the sender because we're thinking about like, gosh, I really need to go do this later or you're kind of drifting off and thinking about what you're going to make for dinner tonight. Instead, not focused on the sender. Emotional noise. Uh, this one tends to be very common, especially if you if, if you just heard that like someone in your family has passed away. It's really hard to go listen to a lecture or listen to something in class or listen to someone else talk. Because you've got that emotional noise going on in your head. that The emotions are so heavy that you're really not able to listen. We also have criticism, which is being inappropriately critical of the speaker. Like, for example, their physical appearance. Um, not necessarily their physical appearance and then how they look, but, you know, if they're wearing a strange hat, for example, you focus so much on that hat that you're not focusing on what they're actually saying. Or maybe a better example is when the person you're talking to has lettuce stuck in their teeth. You're focused so much on the lettuce stuck in their teeth that you're not actually focused on what they're actually saying, so you're not listening to what they're actually saying. When it comes to information processing barriers, first we have the processing rate. So we think a lot faster than we speak, so sometimes it's a lot harder to listen because the speaking, the, pro, the, the speed that which someone is speaking is a lot slower, and we're able to process that information a lot faster. So it takes a lot of time to listen to each word someone says, and then we're processing it very quickly. So it's easy to lose our attention. So you can also think about that from the reverse, from the sender's perspective, or from the, free the sender's perspective, we're always kind of preparing what we're gonna say next. And we're thinking about those things. We're always kind of thinking one step ahead. So we're not always listening to what they're saying because we're thinking faster than, we're, than we can speak. That's also why sometimes we lose our train of thought very easily because we're thinking so much faster. Information overload. Pretend you're taking a class in like nuclear physics. After 50 minutes of a lecture on nuclear physics, you may be so overwhelmed with the material, you can't listen anymore. It's just too much information at one time. A lot of students that will use this example, like say their first day at work where they're getting directions thrown at them 100 miles a minute and they walk out feeling very overwhelmed, like what did I get myself into? That's information overload. Receiver apprehension. This is a really interesting one um, that I, I would actually be interested in doing more research on. We've talked a lot about communication apprehension. Well, maybe not necessarily yet, but we will. And there's a lot of research out there on communication apprehension or the fear of sending messages to others. But the fear of receiving messages is kind of a whole different ballgame, very similar to emotional noise. When we have a lot of anxiety about receiving a message, we may not listen to it appropriately because that anxiety is kind of taking over. So this is the fear of misunderstanding or misjudging messages. Um, you know, if you know, say, for example, you know someone that's really, really judgmental and is going to snap at you right away if you say something wrong um, or if you don't, if you misinterpret what they're going to say. When you talk to them, you may be so anxious because you think if I interpret this wrong, they're going to just snap at me because you're not really listening to what they're saying because you're trying so hard. It just but you can't because you're just so anxious about it. Another example of this could be if you're in a situation where, you know, there is a, you're say you're in a classroom and the instructor is giving a lecture and it is very dense material, like something calculus and you don't have a lot of confidence. Well, I'm not going to understand this. I'm going to try really hard, but I'm not going to understand it. A lot of times because of that anxiety of thinking you're not going to understand what they're saying, meaning then you're not going to understand what they're saying. Shifting attention is another information processing barrier, especially now that we have cell phones and distractions like Facebook and things are ringing. In fact, I already had to stop this lecture once because the phone was ringing. What happens is when we're multitasking, moving from one message to another, to another, to another, we can't listen to each one effectively. So what happens is we get pieces of each message, but we don't get one full message. 
context barriers, time and place. Some of us are just better listeners in the evening and some of us are better listeners in the afternoon. You say you have your um, significant other comes up to you and says, we need to have a conversation right now about this conflict. If you do that at 11 o'clock at night, at least in my house, you know, we're not going to get anything done. Nothing's going to be accomplished because we can't listen to each other at that time of night. Um, perhaps the morning is better. Some students like to take classes in the morning and some students like to take evening classes, depending on how alert you are during that time. So the listening makes a difference when it comes to time and place. Place, also, I guess I didn't provide an example of place, but place might be the location. Do you like being in an auditorium and listening? Do you like one-on-one? -on -one? Do you like being in the house? Do you like being, you know, in the store? But obviously those are context barriers too. You may not have a very deep conversation in the middle of Target versus a very deep conversation at home. That's why a lot of people go to coffee shops. The environment is right. External noise, we talked about this as part of the first unit, um, anything that interferes with the ability to process that's in the environment, you know, a loud truck driving by, um, it could be the phone ringing in the background, it, it's distracting, it's something in the environment. Some barriers to effective listening, these are more behavioral barriers. Um, pseudo listening, this is where you give the appearance of being attentive by using nonverbal communication tools. So I'm going to say, uh huh, yeah, oh, really? Really? No way. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. But you're not actually hearing any listening to anything they're saying. You're hearing them. You're providing cues like you are listening, but you're not actually comprehending anything they're saying. Maybe because, and I think one of the common times when we do this is when someone's talking to us and there's like a really interesting conversation going on behind us. We're really attending to that conversation behind us and listening to what they're saying and then just pretending to listen to the person we're actually talking to. Because you can't listen to both at the same time. It's just not possible. You can pick up pieces of both, but you can really only attend to one. Selective listening is responding to only the parts of the message that interest the listener, nothing else. So one of the best examples of this is when, say your child comes home from school, and they're telling you every little thing they did today, what everybody said, what every little activity they did, and you're like, yeah, uh -huh. you, know, you might engage in some pseudo listening there. And then you hear something about $20, and all of a sudden you stop and think, okay, I better listen to this now. $20, because they need, say, $20 to go on a field trip. You hear that part $20, well, that's really interesting. Now I need to stop, start listening. Um, defensive listening, taking innocent comments as personal attacks. So this is an example of, this is actually when we start to see defensive listening can actually signal uh, bad news for a relationship. We'll talk about that later. But um, this is like, say, a husband says to a wife, those pants are tight on you. You know, maybe, maybe he means it in a very flattering way. But the wife takes it as, are you saying I'm fat? That's taking an innocent comment as a personal attack. That's defensive listening. Again, generally defensive listening, when you start to do that, you know, it happens occasionally innocently once in a while. But when it starts to become a regular part of the relationship, that eventually does signal, um, you know, some... One of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, according to John Gottman, meaning the relationship's kind of on the downhill. Ambushing. We see this a lot in political situations where we collect information to attack what a speaker has to say. So we're only listening for the parts where we can attack them on it later. That's really not a good behavior to engage in. Insulated listening. This is when a listener does not wish to face a topic of an, or an issue, so they'll not listen or comprehend a message. So a lot of times this happens maybe with uh, political situations. If, say, a Democrat and a Republican are talking, um, they might not want to hear what the other person has to say, so they just tune them out. I'm not going not gonna to listen to it. Insensitive listening, taking a speaker's remarks at face value. I don't really have a really good example of this, but... Part of listening and part of kind of perception is really being able to understand the content and the context and the tone of what someone's saying. So say if they're just being very sarcastic about something and you're not able to see that sarcasm. That's an example of insensitive listening. You're not listening. You're listening to the words that they're saying, but you're not actually listening to the tone of voice that they're saying it in or the reason why they're telling you. And that's what we're going to kind of talk about in the next section with paraphrasing is to how to really focus on the content the intent of what they're saying and the tone and put it all together.